um i think we can start uh, the recording has started so i'll give a short introduction um wait uh, can you all, can you hear me yes i can hear you yeah okay um okay so hello everyone to our seventh talk of this alumni talk series um today we have akshay suresh from the batch of 2017 so he is currently a graduate student at the uh, astronomy department at cornell university and he works on in radio astronomy primarily primarily uh, including uh, transient phenomena such as pulsars fast radio bursts radio exoplanets and extraterrestrial intelligence signals um so i think uh, today he will talk about uh, the enigma of fast radio bursts and i'll uh, hand over the stage to him uh, akshay you can start thanks very much for the kind introduction i hope everyone can see my screen uh view my cursor and also hear me can somebody confirm yes we can hear I, you we can see it okay yeah thank you very much so i hope to excite you all today about fast radio bursts which is a blooming field of research i'll start off by giving you a brief overview of my journey into astronomy starting from my icer days and i began in icer in 2012 and at the time when i began i neither had the prerequisite background nor the skills to do research in astronomy so i started out for my first two years two and a half to three years doing mostly coursework and fortunately i had a python course in a very in my very first semester and that helped jump start my research into astronomy so for those of you who are aspiring to be astronomy researchers i strongly advise to learn some uh, coding software either c++ or python most astronomers today use python my first entry into research in astronomy came through the nius physics program nius stands for the national initiative in undergraduate sciences and this camp is held annually at the homi baba center for science education in mumbai at this camp one gets to attend lectures in advanced physics do labs at the end of the lab at the end of these uh, sessions you are evaluated and based on your performance you get to pick a project of your choice fortunately i got to pick one pertaining to solar physics at this point of time i was not certain which branch of astronomy or which subfield within astronomy i was interested in I just chose one since my faculty mentor would be based at the National Center of Radio Astrophysics in Pune. NCRA, which is and ISA Pune, are only about four kilometers apart, and so I could juggle my research commitments alongside my coursework for majority of my time, and that helped me jumpstart. And it was quite usual, quite important later on. So for a one year period starting from december 2013 i spent my time mostly writing efficient code to enable large scale data processing i didn't know the basic plasma physics required to understand or extract signs from the solar data so there wasn't much physics i did at that point by the summer of 2015 i wanted to try something different so i did a summer internship at the max planck institute for extraterrestrial physics in germany and here i spent my time working on a computational project doing simulations of stars in our galaxy and then coming back to icer in the following semester i took a stab at a theoretical work studying tides within general relativity this was done as part of a semester long research project that you can take for credits at icer pune and i strongly advise everyone to take advantage of these semester projects at icer to explore what you're interested in and what passionate what you're passionate about finally for my masters this is having done a bit of exploration i realized that what i enjoyed the most was working with data and extracting signs from it and now i was in a position where i could interpret the results i was getting within a physical framework so i went back to solar physics and since i had already written several pipelines for before from before I just needed to modify them a little bit and run it on huge chunks of data and extract the signs quickly. 
And fortunately, by the time of my graduate applications, I was able to get this publication, which you see below, submitted. And that could be what that could have helped, with, helped me with my applications. So moving, and this leads me into where I am doing my PhD now. I'm in my fourth year of my PhD at Cornell University. My research here is again highly data driven and it's in the field of radio astronomy. But I try to address science questions pertaining to different categories or different themes. So here is just an illustration. On the x axis from left to right, you span time scales going from milliseconds to hours. At the millisecond time scale, we have fast radio bursts called FRBs for short. And I'll spend uh, the remainder of this talk talking about FRBs. You have millisecond pulsars and canonical pulsars. Pulsars are neutron stars. You can think of them as these extremely dense objects with effectively the mass of the sun squeezed into a 10 kilometer radius. And pulsars are those neutron stars that emit radiation beams along their magnetic axis. Like a lighthouse, when the radiation beam sweeps your line of sight, you see a pulse, and when it is pointed away, you do not see any light. So the rotation period of the pulsar determines the periodicity of this uh, object. And canonical pulsars have periods from ranging from 100 milliseconds to a few tens of seconds. Millisecond pulsars, on the other hand, as their name suggests, have millisecond periods. And these are neutron stars that have spun up to their millisecond periods through accretion from a companion. And that's what you see illustrated in the bottom left figure. The in the right figure, I'm trying to study radio exoplanets and investigate planetary habitability. This is another topic that really excites me. And what is crucial here is planets like the Earth have a magnetic field. And the magnetic field shields us from solar flares and incoming charged particles from the sun. Now, imagine if the Earth's magnetic field died away then the Earth's atmosphere would get gradually stripped away by the solar wind, and we wouldn't be able to survive without an atmosphere. So the magnetic field could be crucial for determining planetary habitability, and a planet must sustain a magnetic field for sufficiently long in its history for life to evolve. And the way we determine magnetic field strengths is to look for aurora in the radio. So in in the, on the Earth, you must be familiar about the Aurora Australis and the Aurora Borealis, which also called the Southern and the Northern Lights, respectively. If you look at these lights in the radio, you can estimate the magnetic field strength of the planet, and this is a powerful technique. So far, we have zero detections of exoplanets at radio wavelengths, but if we do get one in the coming decade, it's going to be a big discovery, and there are already signs that we might be coming very close to a detection. So stay, stay tuned for several news pertaining to radio exoplanets. And without further ado, let's jump into the topic for today, FRBs, which is an exciting hot area of research today. And I hope to excite you all about it. What are FRBs? These are bright millisecond duration pulses coming from outside our galaxy. We first discovered these in 2007. So they are pretty recent phenomena. And we have about 137 detections to date. And this number 137 is as of October 15th. What is exciting about them? We estimate that there are thousands of these FRBs going off in the sky every day. And each is a million times more luminous than the sun. Yet we don't know what produces them. Why are they produced? And the description I've shown you here raises a lot of questions. You've seen these pulses. Firstly, how do you know that they are extragalactic in nature or they originate outside our galaxy? Secondly, they're really bright and they occur so frequently. We've detected weaker signals like pulsars starting in the 1960s leading up to the 2000s. Why has it taken us such a long time to detect fast radio bursts? What could be the sources that produce these fast radio bursts? And finally, how does my research fit in with our current understanding of FRBs? So I hope to take you through these different questions in sequence. And I'll start off with the first question. How do you know FRBs originate outside our galaxy? And there's an interesting history to FRBs as well. 
which I hope you find amusing. And to begin, the first important concept we need to understand is dispersion, which is illustrated in this cartoon below. What is dispersion? Dispersion just means the different colors of light travel at different speeds in a medium. In vacuum, all colors, all frequencies, or all wavelengths of light travel at the same speed, which is a speed of light 300 million meters per second. But the universe is not a vacuum. There's a lot of dust in the universe. There are neutral atoms. And most crucially, there are ions and electrons. And it's these charged species which impede the motion of light through the universe. How exactly do these charged species uh, permit or obstruct the motion of light? Let's discuss this. So here I have an illustration. There's a source on the left, and you can assume it can be a pulsar, an FRB source, or any other object which emits light. You have an observer on the right viewing through his radio telescope. And this is not how a radio telescope looks for, uh, just, to list, just to mention. And you have a plasma cloud intervening your line of sight to the source. By plasma, I mean it contains electrons and ions. Now, the source emits radiation at a number of colors or a number of frequencies. Here in this illustration, blue represents the highest frequency, yellow a lower frequency, and red even lower. All these colors enter the cloud at the same time. But once they are in the cloud, the highest frequency travels the fastest, so blue travels fastest, yellow travels slower, and red travels even slower. So when, as an observer, when you see the light, you see the blue light reaching you first, followed by the yellow, and finally the red. And this sort of behavior is called as dispersion. Now, how exactly does this plasma cloud behave, and how is the dispersion mathematically described? If you can fit a quadratic to the arrival times of different frequencies, you find that the arrival time goes as one over frequency squared. And fitting for this quadratic, you can determine the fitting constant, which is crucial for understanding uh, the plasma cloud. And this constant is called the dispersion measure. So if you're not mathematically oriented, you can think of the dispersion measure as simply the an average electron density in the cloud multiplied by the distance to the source. Now, if the source is a pulsar and you know the distance to it through alternate techniques such as parallax, then you can divide the distortion measure by the distance and calculate an average electron density. This is very useful for building electron density maps of the Milky Way. So here is just a proof of concept. So on the left, you see a single pulse, a single bright pulse from a pulsar. The bottom left panel shows what is called the time frequency plane, the time plotted on the x-axis increasing to the right, and frequency on the y-axis increasing upwards. Now, in this panel, the whites denote higher intensity or higher flux, and the blacks are just representing noise. So you can clearly see, your eyes can quite clearly pick up a sweep, a wide sweep in this panel. And you notice that the sweep arrives at you earlier at higher frequencies and later at lower frequencies. This is a consequence of the dispersion which we just discussed. And how astronomers measure the dispersion measure is to fit a quadratic to this sweep. We like to measure the total flux associated with this emission. So what we do is we shift the various pixels so that they all line up at the arrival time of the highest frequency. So in this picture, the vertical line represents the arrival time at the highest frequency. And then you shift the pixels at lower frequencies to this vertical line. Then you sum, the, sum up the flux across frequency, and that's how you obtain the top panel. In the top panel, you can measure the and uh, how much energy this particular burst contains. And you can clearly see the burst sticks out above the noise. Having measured this constant called the dispersion measure along one direction to a pulsar, you can repeat this exercise for multiple pulsars and figure out how many electrons are there between you and the pulsar in different directions through the galaxy. And this is, this is one of the reasons why extensive surveys for pulsars have been carried out 
since the early 2000s. And it was in one such survey, the very first FRB was discovered. This FRB, termed the Lorimer burst, was discovered by Professor Duncan Lorimer and his student looking at some archival pulsar data. And th this here you see is the Parkes telescope, the 64 meter Parkes telescope. With the diameter is 64 meters, and this is in Australia. On the left, you can see this bright pulse, which is clearly st sticking out of the data. Now here, black denotes higher flux density. And you can see it is dispersed, which tells you it is astrophysical. This horizontal black line is a known frequency used by a TV station. So we know it's terrestrial and it's not important. But what really stuck out about this pulse was that its dispersion was much higher than the Milky Way could explain. So if you look at pulsars, which are close to the direction to this particular FRB, the contribution you expect from the Milky Way would be this red curve. And you notice that what you actually see in the data is more dispersed. And that tells you that this object must be coming from outside our galaxy, and hence possibly extragalactic. Now, there was a question in the chat which says, which asked me if the amplitude of the pulse in the previous page is dependent on frequency. The answer is yes. You, will, you do see a frequency dependent amplitude. And so going back to the previous slide, if you imagine that you chop off the spectrum here, you discard everything below 1400 megahertz and just take the top part and construct a pulse profile, you will get a you will find that the you will find that the flux that you determine is different from that in the bottom of the band and that is useful for understanding the intrinsic emission spectrum of the object so a good question and that is all, again something which i'll come to later in the talk and you'll see frbs display very different structures from pulsars so here you see that this pulsar pulse is very broadband and it fills the entire observing band that is not true of frbs so coming back to the Lorimer burst. Uh, sorry, uh, sorry. Uh, can you please go back to the previous slide? Sure. Uh, uh, so while constructing the amplitude versus time graph, uh, do you simply add up all the uh, all the amplitudes from various frequencies, or do you do some some sort of averaging over frequency? Yeah, so what yeah. you do is you shift the pixels so that all this emission is lined up at a single time, and then you just sum up over frequency. Because so, it's just a sum, not an average. So is there I mean, a particular reason for that? I mean, you don't, summing or averaging does not make a difference because if you just sum up, you get the total flux rather than the average flux. And anyways, from, if, Doing either ways, you're adding up the same number of samples, and so the noise in your data gets beaten down by the same factor. And what you're really interested in when you do the detection for the first time is the signal to noise. What is the amplitude of the peak compared to the amplitude of the noise? And when you do an averaging versus just summing up, there is no difference mathematically. But yes, summing up is usually preferred because it is one less operation, there's no division. And by just summing up, you can get a sense for the total flux across this band. Does it answer your question? Yes, thank you. OK, and then there was another question. Why couldn't the disparity mean that there was some plasma from a star in between? So the thing is, if you, you know the direction to this FRB, and if there was a star, you would have seen it emit light in the optical and other wavelengths. The thing, we do not observe any optical counterpart or we do not see any optical source towards the direction of this FRB. And that tells you that uh, it couldn't have been a star. Could it be some kind of dense plasma cloud, which we did not know about? Perhaps, but again, using, F using pulsars, you've extensively mapped out the region of space close to this FRB. And we have no evidence that a plasma cloud is present. And again, plasma clouds also emit continuum emission in the radio, and which we do not see that in the direction of this FRB. Hence, the only conclusion we could think of is either, one, the, the FRB is coming from outside our galaxy, or two, there is some kind of dense plasma material which is invisible to us otherwise. And 
that's the latter seems unlikely, but at the point of this discovery, even the former was unlikely. And the reason being that pulsars are very weak. And if you take a pulsar, an average pulsar, and place it in our nearest galaxy, you couldn't see it with the telescopes that we have, the radio telescopes. So this discovery was met with a lot of skepticism at the point of publication. Subsequently, four more FRBs were discovered, again in parks data. And Shriyansh, just to illustrate the point here, I show you different frequencies, and you can see that the peak flux is frequency dependent. So this is just an illustration. And you can see the inverse quadratic sweep of the FRB. But one thing was that an FRB, you detected an FRB. You look back at the same patch of sky. You tried to see if the FRB could be detected again, but you were unsuccessful. So could the detection have been a chance or maybe something associated with a cataclysmic explosion, like the death of a massive star? Maybe. But there, was other, there were other interesting points in the parks data. At the time when these FRBs were reported, there were also these weird structures called peritons, which, which were frequent in the parks data. The peritons, if you notice in the right panel, it's again the frequency time plane. They are brighter at the top of the band than at the bottom. And if you try to fit the sweep, a quadratic did not do a good job. You needed a much steeper dependence. And that seemed to throw us off. Why were these weird signals seen in only the parks data? And what were these peritons? So a graduate student set about timing when these FRBs were detected, timing when each periton was detected. And there was a curious finding, which I hope will amuse you. Here is a histogram showing the number of events against the time of the day. This is Australian Eastern Standard Time. The FRBs are in purple, a relatively flat distribution. And peritons, however, all seem to occur around noon. Now, why would the universe prefer lunchtime at Sydney? That seems very strange, right? And this immediately tells us that what we are seeing Peritons are not astrophysical. They must be coming from somewhere terrestrial. And so a detailed investigation was carried out and published as a paper. And what it was found was that close to the Parkes telescope, there's a road leading to a visitor center where astronomers uh, can sleep, relax. And there's a microwave oven there to facilitate uh, or to make life easy for the astronomers. Turns out that a periton is generated when a microwave oven door is open prematurely. So imagine that you have food and you place it in the microwave oven to heat for two minutes. One minute in, you get impatient, you open the door, grab the food. The moment you open the door and the microwave is still running, radio waves leak out. And if your telescope is pointed roughly in the direction of the visitor center, it picks up a periton. And this was a very interesting finding. And now if you go to radio telescope sites, you'll see that microwave ovens are placed inside shields, like Faraday cages. And another reason why you should turn off your mobile phones and no mobile communica wireless communications in a radio telescope site. A question in the chat again, have FRBs been seen simultaneously with GRBs? The answer is no. We have not seen a counterpart to FRBs at other wavelengths besides radio. And that's another mystery which still puzzles us. So I hope you found the story about microwave ovens amusing. It clearly tells us that peritons are terrestrial, but the FRBs seem astrophysical. But there is still the question, why were FRBs seen only with parks? And fortunately, again, looking at some archival pulsar data, Laura Spittler, who is a former graduate student at Cornell working with my current PhD advisor, found this particular pulse. This pulse called FRB 121102 holds a special place in FRB astronomy. It was the first one detected with a different telescope, the Arcebo telescope, which is 300 meters in diameter. This large single dish is in Puerto Rico in the United States. 
Now, a key point about this particular Arcebo pulse is that if you notice, it's pretty weak in comparison to the other pulses. You cannot see it in the bottom of the band, effectively. You only see it brighter at the top. So efforts were made to redetect this pulse using multiple telescopes. And voila, redetections re discovered. You've seen multiple repeats of this burst. And the first thing a repetition tells you is any explosion like a supernova can immediately be ruled out for this kind of repeating burst or an FRB. Here is just a set of plots. Again, a lot of frequency time plane showing you the FRB detection. And astronomers like to remove the inverse frequency squared sweep and look at the spectrum of the object. So here, the inverse frequency squared sweep you saw in the previous plots were removed. Now, a question, why cannot this be a pulsar, which is a good question. This again comes to estimating the Milky Way contribution to the dispersion. So if you try to estimate the Milky Way contribution, it would be less dispersed. It would look something like what my cursor is sweeping. Um, what so, is the white lines? So the white lines are just dispersion curves uh, parallel to the FRB just to guide your eye so that okay. you pick out where the FRB is. OK, thanks. So you can clearly pick out the FRB at the top of the band, but not at the bottom. So that's what the white lines are meant to do. So again, the key point which tells you that this is an FRB and not a galactic object is dispersion in excess of what the Milky Way can explain. And I'm quite happy to be part of the group that I'm working with currently because we have some history contributing directly to this particular FRB and just quite revolutionary in our understanding. So the Arcebo FRB repeats, which means you can point other telescopes at the patch of sky from where it is coming and pinpoint where exactly it is coming from. Arcebo has a localization size of one arc minutes. So which means when you look at the sky, this is a background optical image. And the orange square that you see here, the large orange square, is a patch of sky about an arc minute in size within which the source must be, according to Arcebo. You can target this patch with radio interferometers and obtain arc second resolution. And that's what we did. And you look at this small red circle in the inset. That is the localization actually using the very large array. This is a radio interferometer in the US. Now, if you look, go back to this optical image and look within this red circle, there's a dwarf galaxy sitting there. And which means, and there's only one galaxy, which is really br bright enough. So the FRB must be coming from here. And measuring the distance to this particular galaxy, you infer that the burst was emitted nearly 2.4 billion years ago. Pretty long time. And this is the first direct proof that FRBs are an extragalactic phenomenon. This particular host galaxy, for comparison, is about 10 times smaller than the Milky Way and much less massive as well. So based on the properties of the host and the FRB itself, hundreds of theories were proposed. And at this point of time, you had more theories than FRB detections. So another question, is this a one-off case considering the previous ones did not repeat? At this point of, at, now we are at 2017 in the timeline. And at that point, only 121102 was known to repeat. Now we know many more repeaters. And we think that most FRB are repeaters, except that you do not have the sensitivity or the telescope uh, size sufficient to view the weaker events. And I'll come address this in detail later in my talk as well. So right now, in the timeline, we are in 2017. And you have more theories than FRB detections. We need more detections. Otherwise, theory is just going haywire. It does not make any sense. We need to understand why we were not seeing FRBs in plenty. And those that were discovered were seen in pulsar surveys. To, know, to realize this, we need to, do a, we need to understand some fundamentals about telescopes. And let us just overview two key points, one being the telescope sensitivity. What is the faintest signal? that a telescope can reliably measure. And the second being the telescope field of view. What is the patch of sky from which the telescope can see light? 
the sensitivity of the telescope goes as diameter squared, whereas the field of view goes as inverse of the diameter. So what this means is large telescopes can see fainter objects, but only smaller patches of sky. And that's what the RCBO and the Park telescope primarily do. Smaller telescopes can see larger patches of the sky, but are not as sensitive. And this was a crucial realization. Pulsars are mostly weak emitters, and they're found within a few degrees of the galactic plane. So as long as you focus your survey on the galactic plane using large single dish telescopes, you are fine. FRBs, on the other hand, are bright. And since they are extra galactic, they are not confined to the galactic plane. So they occur all over the sky. And since they are bright, you don't need a really large single dish telescope. You are fine with a smaller telescope. And therefore, all, you, all that mattered was a wide field of view. So a long time looking at the sky plus a wide field of view was ideal for finding FRBs. And with this realization, we have now two major FRB hunting machines, CHIME and ASCAP. CHIME stands for the Canadian Hydrogen Intensity Mapping Experiment. And this, this telescope is comprised of cylindrical dishes that view large swaths of the overhead sky. So the dishes are stationary. And as the Earth rotates, sources move in and out of the CHIME field of view. ASCAP, on the other hand, is comprised of 36 dishes each dish has a 12 meter diameter. So they're very small in comparison to say parks or RCBO. But what you can do is you can point these dishes in different directions as shown in this figure. And each dish therefore maps out a different region of the sky, thereby improving your sky coverage. And as long as you observe for sufficiently long times, you will see a good handful of FRBs. And with this process, both CHIME and ASCAP have contributed to nearly 100 of the detections that we have so far. And the number is still growing at an exponential rate. There were a couple of questions in the chat, which I'll come to. So why are FRBs uh, visible only at radio wavelengths? So that could, be, that could be due to the emission intrinsic to the source. We don't fully understand why you do not see these uh, sources at X-ray or uh, other wavelengths. If you consider a neutron star, a neutron star emits in X-rays as well. And maybe since these neutron stars are so far away in another galaxy, you could not see the X-ray radiation, but the radio emission is much brighter, and hence you can detect it. Was the RCBO detection and detecting the FRB a coincidence? Yes, it was purely a coincidence. Even the Parks ones, you were not expecting it. So it is all serendipity. Why no FRBs in the Milky Way? Stay tuned, you'll get the answer at the end. Uh, why does the field of view decrease with the diameter of the telescope? So the field of view for a single dish telescope, such as RCBO or PARKS, is nothing but its resolution. And from basic diffraction physics, you might have come across that telescope resolution scales as wavelength over diameter. Hence, the diameter, the larger the telescope, the smaller the field of view. This is just fundamental physics to do with diffraction of light. Thanks. So I think I've answered the questions in the chats. Really good questions. And you're asking questions which I'll answer subsequently in my talk, particularly the FRBs in the Milky Way, which is a huge finding this year. So what we have today, thanks to CHIME and ASCAP primarily, there are other FRB detection machines. but. CHIME and ASCAP are the ones raking in the numbers. We have a total of 137 detections. 22 of them are seen to repeat. So turns out we have many more like FRB 121102. We don't see a pattern to the repetition. So we can't, for most of them, you cannot tell if the repetition happens in a periodic fashion or not. For 13 of these 137 FRBs, you have identified which galaxy it is coming from. And the properties of the galaxy are very diverse. So I've shown you three examples here. In the top left, you see an elliptical galaxy. And in the bottom two panels, you see spiral galaxies. In each of these figures, the background is an optical or infrared image. And the FRB localization is denoted by a circle. So if you squint your eyes, you might see a tiny 
black circle in the top left panel, a white circle in the bottom right panel, and the circle in this case for the bottom left is even tinier, but for now I'll just tell, I just suggested you go by the crosshairs that are seen. So starting with the top right, you have a massive galaxy, massive elliptical galaxy, and the FRB is coming from its outskirts. In the bottom right, the FRB is coming from one of the spiral arms of an, another galaxy. And so too for the one on the bottom left. The bottom left is another FRB which holds a, which is a landmark detection in FRB astronomy, and you'll soon see why. So how do we know that repeating versus non-repeating FRBs are from the same phenomenon and not two completely different things? Good question. So if you imagine that you have an object that produces FRBs, it will produce FRBs over a range of energies. And maybe with the telescopes that we have, we are only seeing the cream of the, uh, cream of the distribution. We are only seeing the most bright ones. And there are weaker ones which we, could, we cannot see where we are. Maybe if we move closer, we can see the weaker ones. So this is why the concept of repetition versus non-repetition is telescope dependent. If you have a really sensitive telescope, you can see fainter ones, and so you are more likely to see repeaters as compared to a single dish small telescope, which might see a single burst from a particular FRB source, but not maybe weaker repetitions. Does that answer your question? Why are the repetitions weaker? Oh, it's just the intrinsic distribution of energies from a source. There's no reason to believe that the source will emit pulses at the same energy. Even pulsars, for example, you might see one really bright pulse once every 10 to 15 periods, and then other pulses are really weak. So it's just that stochasticity, stochasticity associated with the emission. Great, thanks. Uh, going by the previous question, how accurate is the periodicity of the periodic FRBs? Uh, that's my next slide, so I'll, I'll answer it now. So periodicity has been discovered in two FRBs, FRB 180916, which was the one I indicated in the bottom left here, and FRB 121102. Again, it turns out to be a landmark FRB. The repetition periods are very large, 16.35 days and 157 days. And how you'd see this repetition is by monitoring bursts, arrival times over a very long period. So this is a really involved plot. Follow me as I go in steps through this plot and ask me questions if you feel something is unclear. On the x-axis is observing date. And on the y-axis is exposure time measured in minutes. Exposure time just means how much time has te a telescope spent looking at the source. In this case, we are talking about Chime looking at the source. So the black dots denote when Chime was looking at this particular FRB source. The red downward arrows represent epochs when Chime detected an FRB, detected a burst from the source. So here, if you can see my cursor, in this white section here, Chime was seeing the source but did not see a burst. And then Chime saw a burst at this time where this red arrow is indicated. The gray bars are five-day windows, and these windows are repeated at an interval of 16.35 days. Notice how these red arrows follow very neatly within these five-day windows. You do not have a red arrow for every five-day window. So for example, here where my cursor is right now, you have a five-day window where Chime was observing. The black dots, again, to remind you, denote that Chime was observing the source. But you don't have a detection. So there is no detection for every five-day window. However, when you see a burst, it definitely falls within this five-day window that you predict. And if you had a very narrow snapshot of time, say between January 2019 to June 2019, you wouldn't have been able to see the periodicity. Now, from the repetition of this pattern across a long time, you could see that the five-day windows repeat in roughly 16.35 days. And so a periodicity was discovered only through long observing time. So a similar exercise was carried out for FRB 121102. In that case, you had bursts arriving 
in a 80 day window with a 157 day periodicity. And these periodicities are very long and compared to the rotation of a pulsar. So the question was, what theories can explain this? Do any theories become favorable for explaining the data? So if you're curious, you can go to this FRB theory catalog where there is a full table of theories and it's neatly organized. So even if you don't have much background, you can just go and understand what's happening. Fortunately, I'm relieved that we have more FRB detections than theories today. So that's a good point. And two major theories that stick out to explain the data and particularly periodicity are shown in those figures. In figure A, you have a neutron star in companion with a high mass star. The FRB originates on the neutron star and the companion sends out a powerful stellar wind that obscures the neutron star. So if you're down here at the bottom of the figure, you can see the emission from the neutron star without any obscuration. However, if you're at the left edge or the right edge of this figure, the emission from the neutron star is obscured by the stellar wind and you do not see it. So the periodicity associated with the FRB is the orbital motion of this neutron star above the center of mass. The second theory that we have is you just have a neutron star and the neutron star, like a pulsar, emits a beam of radiation. And the FRB originates due to magnetic processes happening either close to the surface or somewhat remote from the surface. So down here, as long as you're within the cone of the beam, you see the pulse. But now, unlike the rotation, you also have a slow precision of the beam. And the precision happens over several days. And it is this precision that moves the Earth or moves the beam in and out of the Earth's field of view. And therefore, you see the periodicity associated with the emission. We have only two repeating or two, two repeating FRBs that are seen to be periodic. Hopefully with more data, if we can establish that more FRBs are periodic, then these two theories will gain more traction. And hopefully we can distinguish between one or both of them. An interesting point about FRBs, which continues to puzzle us even today, we don't know what's this, is this kind of weird narrow band structure in the time frequency plane. So now you remove out the frequencies to the minus two sweep and look at what's left. You notice that the emission starts off at higher frequency and then moves down to lower frequencies. And this is called the sad trombone structure in reference to the sound you make when playing a trombone. And this sort of phenomenon is not seen in pulsars, and we still don't know why this is produced. Is it intrinsic to the source, or is this propagation induced? We still don't have a firm handle of it. And FRBs continue to throw up several puzzles. So with this uh, understanding, what questions do I try to address in my research? I've spoken to you a little bit about pulsars and, and some about FRBs. And the plot that you see here is called the radio transient phase space. So you have a number of objects which, are, which, can, be, which can behave as radio transients shown in this object, shown in this figure. The x-axis is the duration of a pulse. And notice it's a log scale. The y-axis is the luminosity, which is a measure of how bright the burst is intrinsically. What I want to drag, draw your attention to is the set of pulsars here, denoted by the orange plus signs. And then FRBs are way above, at least nine orders of magnitudes separating them in energy. FRBs are millisecond duration events, which we believe are related to neutron stars, and so are pulsars. The question, is there a continuum of emission properties going from pulsars to FRBs and could this continuum explain the difference in morphology you see in the time frequency plane? So to do so, we need to detect objects within this empty region between pulsars and FRBs. And what I am trying to see is objects that are right below at the tail, at the lower tail of this FRB distribution. So low luminosity FRBs from nearby galaxies. There's a question, what are GRPs? GRP stands for giant radio pulses. So some of these pulsars, particularly the crab pulsar, emits 
super bright nanosecond duration pulses. And these nanosecond duration, really bright pulses are called GRPs. And you can see again, the fact that we know it's a crap, it's a pulsar and it's pretty close to us is again telling us that whatever is filling this gap between pulsars and FRBs must be neutron star related, but the emission might emission mechanism might differ going from pulsars at the bottom to FRBs at the top. RAT stands for rotating radio transients. These are just pulsars which emit sporadically. So you do not see their, uh, you do not see each and every one of their pulses, but you see the pulses in brief intervals of time, like an FRB. However, the dispersion of these RATs is consistent with the Milky Way, which is why you see them down here grouped with pulsars. Now to answer the question, how do I see low luminosity FRBs from nearby galaxies? Low luminosity. So they are weaker than traditional FRBs, which means I need large dishes to do my research. And since we are looking for something that's like an FRB, if it's extra galactic, it must happen all over the sky. So I need to combine a really high sensitivity with wide field of view coverage. High sensitivity means I need a large telescope and most of my time here is spent working with the Green Bank Telescope that you see pictured in the top. This is a picture of me with the Green Bank Telescope in the background. This is a 100 meter dish located in West Virginia, USA. And what I try to do is to study, uh, is to look for FRBs using the Green Bank Telescope with a phased array feed called FLAG. And flag, a picture of FLAG is shown on the bottom. It is comprised of 19 dipoles. The advantage of using a phased array feed and fitting it at the focus of a telescope is that you can substantially increase the field of view. So using FLAG, you can increase the field of view of the JBT by a factor of seven. So you can scan 1.1 square degrees at 1.5 gigahertz, which is a substantial improvement. I should mention that the very first few FRB detections with parts were also made using a phased array feed, which improved the sky coverage. So this was another learning which I'm implementing in my research. I haven't discovered any FRBs in my data to date, but if I do, I'll be certain to let everybody know. Related to my research, there was an exciting find in April 28th. We detected a really bright burst from a galactic magnetar. And to remind you, magnetars are neutron stars with extraordinarily high magnetic fields of about 10 to the 14 to 10 to the 15 cos. Pulsars, canonical pulsars have field strengths which are about two to four orders of magnitude lower than this number here. Now these, the detection of this burst from the magnetar was made by CHIME and STAR2. STAR2 is a radio interferometer in the Southwest U United States. And this is just a figure, the fre frequency time plane showing the square STAR2 detection. And again, astronomers know the inverse frequency squared sweep which tells you that the signal is astrophysical and we like to remove it to see how the intrinsic emission spectrum is. So the inverse frequency squared sweep has been removed and what you see is just the emission spectrum of this burst from the magnetar. And it fills the full observing band of star two. Now what really excited us was this burst was really bright. How bright was it? If you place it in the luminosity duration diagram, which I had from before, it lands up right here, pretty close to the tail end of the FRBs. So maybe, possibly, all FRBs are sourced by magnetars. And that could be, we need, to, we need more data and we need more such fortunate detections to actually uh, confirm this. But this is a big clue. And, May possibly the first galactic FRB dis, uh, detection. Now, something that I've not spoken about before, we fo I focused on what the source of FRBs are, but FRBs can also be useful for cosmology. Now, I told you that dispersion happens as a consequence of pulse propagation through some plasma, but an FRB is originating in another galaxy. So, which means the pulse has to first move to the host galaxy where the FRB source is, the intergalactic medium, and then the interstellar medium of our own galaxy. 
You know how our galaxy behaves very well, so you can remove out the interstellar medium contribution from the Milky Way. So what is left for dispersion is the intergalactic medium and the host galaxy. And you can trace free electrons in both of these, the intergalactic medium and host galaxies. In addition, if the ionized gas in the intergalactic medium and the other host galaxy has a magnetic field, the polarization of light gets modified. And so by studying the polarization of the FRB radiation, you can estimate the magnetic field strengths at the host and in the IGM. And it turns out that FRB 121102, the RCBO repeater, the first repeater, is in a really dense magnetoionic environment close to the host. So what it means for FRB 121102 is you have a very strong magnetic field in the plasma close to the source, and then the plasma propagates out, interacts with a lot of other unmag mostly unmagnetized plasma in the uh, intergalactic medium, then more unmagnetized or weakly magnetized plasma in the interstellar medium and then of the Milky Way and then reaches us. So to summarize, FRB is a millisecond duration pulses. And as you can see from my previous slides, most of my uh, most of the studies or most of the discoveries are made either in 2019 or 2020. So this is a very active field of research which is continuing to evolve fast. There are several questions for which we do not have any answers. And I hope this excites you to pursue FRBs possibly for your own research if you're interested. So with that, I thank you all for your attention and I'll stop for questions. Um, thanks a lot for this wonderful talk. Um, so there are a couple of questions in the chat. And if anyone has any further questions, they can unmute and ask or put it in the chat box. So I just wanted to emphasize, if you want to ask me about my research career and had questions from the first two slides, I can answer those as well. So should I just go answering questions in the chat one by one, or will you read them out? And how do we go about this? Um, Whatever, I mean, uh, if you can see the questions, you can answer them. Yeah, I can see the questions. So the first question is, it seems to be brighter at lower frequencies. So can you remind me what you're um, referring to? The localized magnet, uh, it looked more reddish at lower frequencies. Yeah, that's, that's correct. So you is see there any reason or no? Uh, I mean, we don't understand this magnetar very well because this is the first time you saw the magnetar in radio. But usually magnetars have a really flat spectrum, so there's no preference for a bright emission at a higher frequency or a lower frequency. However, pulsars are brighter at lower frequencies. So we don't have a good understanding for why this particular emission seems brighter at the bottom. And we also don't know if this bright emission is due to is something that is introduced by the interstellar medium. And if you have inhomogeneities in the interstellar medium, that could amplify emission at certain frequencies more than others. And so we can't distinguish the intrinsic emission from this magnetar from that the interstellar medium can produce. Right, thanks. How do we measure the magnetic fields of neutron stars? Is it from spin down measurements? Yes, that's correct. So the magnetic field you assume to be a dipole, and for a dipole, the magnetic field scales as the square root of the period and the spin and the spin down rate p dot. So b goes as square root of p p dot. Uh, how are man magnetars equipped with extraordinarily high magnetic fields? So we know the magnetic field strengths are much higher than that of regular pulsars. How are they equipped? we still don't understand because we don't have a good theory of magnetar radio emission. So why is the magnetic field so high? It's a question that continues to puzzle us. What are some ultra recent, maybe radical theories regarding FRBs? Well, the most radical one, which is the last solution is aliens, but uh, more radical theories could be, um, Initially, there was a lot of belief that because FRBs ex exhibit the sad trombone structure, there might be something like 
a stellar flat, which also shows a similar sweep. But yeah, uh, all these theories have been beaten down. And actually, if you go down to, to the if you go to the FRB theory catalog, you can see many more examples. I can't think of any right now on top of my head, but yeah, so this is a useful URL if you're curious. How do we track radiation between FRBs and pulsars based on luminosity or duration to know about the morphology and the source? So this is a pretty hard question to answer. So when you look at the FRB itself, you see the morphology in the time frequency plane. And we try to answer whether this morphology is due to something intrinsic to the FRB itself or is propagation induced. So we don't have a good handle for FRBs. For pulsars, you don't see much of this kind of narrow banding structure. What you see is a dispersed pulse, which becomes brighter at lower frequencies. So for pulsar, it's a little more easier to explain that the frequency might mean the lower frequency is coming up, say, from higher up in the magnetosphere. But yet again, pulsar emission is not well understood even now, particularly the radio emission. So that's no firm theory. And both we are working very hard both on the observational side and the theoretical side to understand what, what exactly is, how exactly is the radio emission produced from pulsars. Uh, do the pulsar radiations repeat? Yes, because by, by the name, it's a pulsating source which emits periodically, so the radiation does repeat. I think a different question, how is PhD life compared to BSMS? So in BSMS, you spend a I spent a lot of time doing coursework, and I worked only on one research project. So what it meant was when I was away from courses, I could spend my time focusing on one thing, and I didn't have much distraction apart from other leisure, th uh, leisure that I was interested in. PhD, it's, it can be somewhat hectic. And like you saw from one of my early slides, I have a variety of topics. And so you attend telecons pertaining to each project. And you have to grapple with several projects at a time. So making meaningful progress on one of them can be difficult. And there's a lot of pressure to finish. So now you've seen that FRBs are a really rapidly evolving field. So if I find something and I do not publish it on time, someone else might have found something else. And well, you might have lost your big chance. And you might get scoped up or worse, your publication might not get recognized. So yeah, it, it can be quite stressful. But handling several projects is part and parcel of PhD life. And as you get used to it, you become more, you learn how to manage your time better and accomplish better work-life balance. And that's something that I feel work-life balance is what I have come to appreciate more as a PhD student than a BSM, than as BSM is where I would just do what I felt like, how I felt like, and just simply get something done. Um, how does it feel not detecting an FRB yet? Hmm. I hope to see one, but yeah, like, I mean, there are several people in the same boat as me, and we are just unlucky. Before they were detected, no, because I mean, the only more pulsars. So, we could explain all millisecond duration pulses. Also to be detectable if, you're, if they were in another galaxy. So the concept of an FRB is pretty recent. And the emission is narrow band has thrown several theories off. Um, I missed a question from earlier. How is the contribution from the Milky Way estimated? So the Milky Way contribution is estimated using pulsar maps. The pulsars tell you how much Electron, how many electrons are between you and the pulsar? And if you build a, you can if you detect thousands of pulsars, we've seen about two thousand eight hundred of them so far. You can build a pretty good sense. You have a pretty good sense for what is the electron distribution along different directions. 
you do have to account for dense plasma clouds, and you can see them as Bremsstrahlung emission in the radio. Bremsstrahlung means free, free emission, which is a continuum emission process. So you take into account dense plasma clouds, emission from stars, remove these off, and then build a distribution of free electrons. Uh, what challenges did I face in my master's thesis? So in my master's thesis, the primary challenge I faced was I had worked on the solar physics project for a really long time. And I felt that unless I had something to show for it, my graduate applications would not have as much weight because I had limited experience working on other kinds of data. So my main challenge was to finish the work quickly enough and get a publication submitted in time for my application. And a big challenge at this point was that my faculty advisor at this point at, during this period was based at MIT. He was away on a sabbatical. And so I had to do most of my work in consultation with him over Skype or with help from some PhD students at NCRA. And Doing to learning to do research with minimal uh, interactions with your advisor was a huge challenge for me. And at least that experience helped me help stand me in good stead because now I'm able to do research more independently without having frequent interactions with my advisor. And mostly when I discuss with my advisor, we know the methods we are applying and we know new methods which we could apply. The question is what kind of results do we produce? Do the results make sense? How can you interpret the results? These are the questions that I'm asking in the interactions now with my advisor. Does that answer your question, Ajay? I think it's Ajay who asked that. Yeah, thanks. I, I got my answer. OK. Yeah, thanks. Um, how do you, so Vijay Subramanian asks, how do you suggest going to learning about Python? What are the libraries that helped you most? So this is a good question. So back in 2012, we had a Python course. And following on from that Python course, I had to learn how to plot stuff with Matplotlib and learn various signal processing techniques. So like what is meant by Fourier transform, how to fold data and find an underlying periodicity. So these signal processing techniques are the ones which took up most of my time and learning how to implement them in data and in Python. There are several NumPy routines. NumPy is a package with, within, within Python which serve useful. So as someone who wants to get started, the first thing I would just say is learn how to plot, just generate plots with Python. And if you just Google, you'll find useful, to, useful tutorials particularly designed for astronomers to use Python. I can send you links if you want me to. And the second thing is there are faculty at ISER, including like Prasad Subramanian, Saurabh Dobe, who do a lot of signal processing. Ask them about uh, how you would go doing, uh, try to learn some signal processing routines from them. So for example, match filtering, uh, which whereas you have a pulse and then you convolve it with a specific filter function and see improve its signal to noise. So learning tools like these help you a long way when you're starting out in astronomy. And fortunately for those of you who are in Pune, you can anytime go to NCRA and Ayuka and just tell the faculty that you're not looking for a project per se, but uh, you're looking to learn some signal processing routines from fundamentals, and they're more likely to give you a project based on that in your first, first year or second year than a full-fledged research project where you extract the science results. So this would be one way to go about it. Uh, how do you feel about the recent in events concerning RCBO? Yeah, that's pretty disappointing to say. I do use the RCBO telescope for my research. And the fact that a cable broke and the dish got damaged means um, the observations are on halt. And RCBO 
has held a special role in research at Cornell up to 2011. It was Cornell University that managed the telescope. So you could say to an extent, we are all devastated. At least fortunately for my research, I've already gathered the data that I need. So I'm not severely impacted, but I have collaborators who do uh, worry what happens to their research. And more crucially, the funding for RCBO is going down. So that's a big question over the future of RCBO. Have we already done our last observations with RCBO? And that's something the National Science Foundation can only decide. So how long will RCBO be down for? So I should tell you that the first cable break happened in August and just six days earlier, on November 6th, a second cable break happened. And it turns out, so let me just go back to the picture of RCBO that I had. So if you notice, there is this big dish and all the receivers and the instruments are placed above in the structure called the Gregorian dome. And this dome is held in place by these, by these cables from various towers. Turned out that in one of the towers called Tower 4, there have been multiple cable breaks. And if another cable breaks, the tower would not be able to support the dome and this tower would fall off. So it's quite serious and a lot of the engineering has been quite poor. So the situation is fairly critical, I must say, unfortunately. So you might see a downtime of, I estimate a year or more realistically two years perhaps, provided funding is good from NSF. So sorry for the bad news if you're an RCBO fan, but yeah, things are not looking bright and it's 2020. Did you come from a computational, from a comp side background or did you have background in Python before joining ISA? No, I did not. I knew how to code in C and C++, but not Python. So my first experience with Python was the intro Python course I had in my very first semester. Did I have a computer, did I have a computer science background? I presume you are asking me if I did computer science in my 11th and 12th, and the answer is yes. So I think I've answered most, nearly all of the questions on the chat. If I missed out any, please feel free to interrupt me. You can always speak out. I haven't heard from those of you who are on the call, so I do encourage all of you to speak out and ask me questions directly. How helpful was doing your BSMS at ISER for PhD, apart from developing interest in science? This is a really good question. So at first, when I finished my BSMS, I didn't really appreciate the ISER coursework much. But after, after coming to the US and seeing what kind of graduate courses that people do here, I began to realize that the graduate coursework here is comparable to the BSMS coursework you do at ISA. And so, so US graduate students tend to learn different techniques and different science in the early years of their PhD. Whereas we've already learned that in undergrad. And so when we come directly to PhD research, I would say we are better placed in terms of understanding of the underlying physics. And that certainly helps you more quicker with your research than you would otherwise. So the ICER, the intensive ICER coursework does pay off a lot on the long run. And so I would recommend that you do all the basic physics courses like ENM, quantum mechanics, classical mechanics. And ICER also offers, I feel, a couple of, I think a couple of astronomy courses, if I recall. There is an intro astro course, which used to be taught by Ramana Atreya. And then there's an astrophysical processes course taught by Prasad Subramanian. So yeah, that course is not there anymore. Oh, that's unfortunate. So astrophysical is, processes. Sorry, go ahead. There is uh, astrophysics by uh, which I think Ramana takes. There is gravitation and cosmology, and they introduced a new course, advanced gravitation or something. And there is plasma physics. So I think that yeah, that's. 
Okay, so fluid dynamics, plasma physics are other two courses which are important for astronomy. And astrophysical processes, I mentioned like it was really useful for me because like most of my research is about studying emission and that's what astrophysical processes is about. I had an identical course co after coming here to Cornell and what I found was the content covered was exactly the same, the same textbook as well. So just practically a repeat for me. And if you gain this knowledge earlier on in your uh, research career, you'll be in a much better position. So maybe those of you can at ICER can pitch this in to Prasad and request him to reteach astrophysical processes perhaps. Gravitation and cosmology is a theory-based course, so which involves a lot of calculations, analytical calculations. And so if you're a theorist per se, like one who is interested in doing GR, that course is top-notch or you would you wouldn't find a better alternative if you come to the US and did a GR course here. Some faculty here are really good, but the content are effectively the same. So, so a lot of questions are coming in from Akash Ganga, the Iserfone Astro Club, but I'll try to answer questions from others so that they don't feel left out. How does the fact that FRB signals last for a small short time mean that the source must be small? So this comes from the light travel time argument and FRBs are millisecond durations. So which means if you imagine a source and the leading edge of the FRB is from one end of the source and the trailing edge is from its opposite end, the source diameter is, should be roughly the speed of light times the width of the pulse. And if you multiply a speed of light, which is 300 million meter per second with something which is a millisecond, you get a size which is of order a few tens of kilometers, which must mean a neutron star is the most likely solution. Does it answer your question, Naman? Okay. Uh, so, Akash Ganga, the Isapune Astro Club, asks other questions. So, in the beginning of your BSMS, were you sure of going into astro or did you want to explore? So at least in my case, I was interested in physics and I wanted to do astronomy in particular. So my answer to the first part is yes. I wanted to go into astro and experience what it was like first before seeing if other branches of physics interested me. And I did enjoy my first introduction to astro. So I stuck to astro for the entirety of my research career. But within astro, I certainly wanted to explore. I didn't know what research topics were interesting. I didn't know if I wanted to be a data-driven person or a theorist or working with simulations. So I did a fair bit of exploration pertaining to that. And something I realized is that even when working with data, if I just work on a single topic for a long period of time, I tend to get bored. And that's why I shifted from solar physics to more radio transients. And my PhD research involves a number of topics and a number of projects so that if I get bored with one topic or tired of working on one thing, I can always shift to something else to keep me excited. And I would recommend that you find use the opportunities at ICER to figure out where your interests lie and what excites you the most. Will the SKA be a great advancement in detecting FRBs? Maybe the SKA is still remote and we do not know if the funding that we have is going to be sufficient to build the SKA. It is a very powerful telescope that is planned for the future. So ideally the answer is yes, but unless it gets built, you don't know how useful it is going to be at that point when all these other FRB hunting machines are doing all the science right now. So maybe I'll be in a better position to answer that question five to six years from now. Do the weather conditions like clouds interrupt the observing? Uh, so fortunately, radio astronomers don't have to worry about clouds as much. If you're looking at really high frequencies, high radio frequencies, like about 12 gigahertz and upwards, then 
water vapor in the atmosphere is the one which bothers us the most and not necessarily clouds. But at the frequencies where most FRBs are detected, which is below 8 gigahertz, you don't have to worry about clouds. And observing conditions don't matter. All that you have to worry about is terrestrial interference, such as uh, mobile phones, microwave ovens, uh, TV stations, and so on. So I haven't heard anyone unmuting, so I should tell you that you should unmute and interrupt me if you feel I'm not answering your question or I've skipped your question. Uh, Akshay, how was your experience of doing an internship abroad in your undergraduate days? OK, so when I went to Germany, what I found that the research culture was quite different. So in my undergraduate days, like I used to juggle coursework and research, so I would spend most of the day doing coursework and maybe a short amount of time right before I sleep doing research. And what I, and faculty were always willing to respond to emails, even if I sent them at like 9 p.m. in the night, I might receive a response by email from my advisor at 10:30 p.m., 11 p.m., and so on. But when I went to Germany, uh, scientists there follow a very strict 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. routine on Monday to Friday. They do not open their emails after 5 p.m. on weekdays and never on their weekends. So if you send an email during any of these uh, off hours, you will not get a response until they come back to office. And so adjusting to a 9 to 5 schedule was the biggest challenge for me. And the other major um, other major concerns were more to do with life outside India. So it, when you stay in India for a long time, um, at ISA you have a mess and you don't have to cook most of your food. But once you move abroad, you have to do all the cooking and household management yourself. And so that's an added pressure which eats away at time you could spend doing research or just relaxing. And so trying to find the time to squeeze in research, squeeze in time to relax, just enjoy life, and also manage household responsibilities is something that I didn't have to do in my undergraduate time or when at ISO. So that's another challenge, work-life balance. OK, thanks. Uh, OK, I have another question. Did you encounter racism in any shape or form? Hmm. Uh, I should answer that. This might not be the forum exactly to discuss this, but I didn't face, I haven't faced any, fortunately, from my advisors or from the department where I worked at. But like when I was traveling, say in Germany, whether I had a beard or not reflected the personality of policemen who were patrolling the streets. So if I was if I if I kept a beard, I would be stopped and asked to produce a passport. And if if I couldn't or if I didn't have the passport with me, I would be uh, taken in for questioning. And if I was clean shaven, this did not happen. And so there were these microaggressions from people outside of academia that I faced, but not within academia. But yes, racism is prevalent even within academia, and particularly women and people from minorities and backward races have to deal with these a lot. So yeah, this is quite unfortunate. And I hope we can all work together and strive to push forth a community that's caring for everyone. Is not knowing the German language a problem in Germany? Um, at least not for me, because all my advisors and everyone else I interacted with knew English, and most Germans can understand English at the very least. And at least as part of the DADWISE internship, when you apply and get selected, you have the option of enrolling in a German course, so you can get to learn German on the fly. So. 
German language wasn't necessarily a problem for me. And during my stay there, I learned sufficient German to get by on a daily basis if absolutely required. So the Dadweiss internship and the resources that they provided were really useful. Um, I'll stop the recording now where people can still ask questions. It's already uh, one and a half hours. So All I'll right. stop the recording. Yeah, thank you. And